one thing that I have learned, one thing I have become more and more aware of is of how easily we, even the best of us Christians, can make mistakes and we can get off into side tracks. One of the things that I am sometimes accused of is that I I don't listen to other people. I've heard I've heard some detractors, some people who have a, a fault with our ministry. They say that I am arrogant and that I I don't listen to what other people have to say. And I I always examine myself because of this accusation because I don't want to be that kind of person. And to be honest, when I look back over my experience as a Christian, I think that this is a an unfair accusation because I have I've changed my mind publicly. I've apologized publicly for sometimes getting off in a tangent when I felt I had to change my mind. And I, I think that this is something that is desirable and something I, I, I think all of us should have as a part of our character and our experience. If we are wrong, if God says something shows us something we should we should accept what he says even if we have been long set in a traditional way of thinking and and most of us here are like that because most of us believed in the trinity or most of us believed in an emphasis on the law and it is a testament to the kind of people we are that we have adjusted our thinking <clears throat> but i find that because the path of the just is as a shining light that grows more and more towards the perfect day because of this. I find that, you know, it's always necessary to keep adjusting. And I'm really grateful to God for this because as we go through changes, our, our relationship with God intensifies. It grows better. Our appreciation for God grows greater because of the things that He shows us. Sometimes, we need to change what we once believed. Sometimes it's just that he adds further information that makes him so much more beautiful. Last week and the week before, we focused on a particular theme. And the theme was basically what we have been focusing on all along, which is that Jesus is to be central, is to be everything. And, and, this, and today, <clears throat> I want to go back to that same theme. Probably, you know, every every day of my life, every every time I, I I present a sermon, this will always be the theme. But I want to focus more particular, more particularly at this time. And I want to probably, I don't know exactly what to entitle this um, presentation, but maybe misreading the directions. Or misunderstanding the manual maybe something like that i'll decide on the title afterwards but anyway we often get sidetracked easily and i'm going to show you one of the ways in which we legitimately get off track okay now one one thing that i know everybody here believes everybody here agrees with and understands is that where salvation is concerned we're already saved i think i can put it that way if you look at um ephesians 1 and verse ephesians 2 and verse 8 it says for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god i think everybody who is a part of this fellowship you understand this thoroughly where we are saved as a gift from god and it goes on to say in verse 9 not of works lest any man should boast so one of the, the fundamental principles of our religion is that salvation is by faith is by grace through faith and in in this we are different from people like muslims we are different from people like the Jews were different even from many 
Christian groups, so-called Christian groups who have a great emphasis on works. We believe salvation is by, is by the grace of God. It's a gift from God and that we access this salvation by faith. Everybody in this room, I believe, holds to this conviction. However, I, I, find, I find that sometimes for me, sometimes for other ones of us, something comes up that becomes a little bit of a challenge because we are not only seeking for salvation, but we, we are seeking for victory over sin. We are seeking for victory over sin. If 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 I may, if I believe I, I, I can honestly express one of the concerns I find among many Christians, maybe even among Christians here, is a burning desire to live a more holy life. We say we have been saved. A, we have been saved. Let's move on to B. B is living a holy life. And I, I, I see evidence sometimes that some, some of us get very frustrated because it seems that that part of the, the experience is not being fulfilled in the way that we expect. This is a legitimate concern. It seems, I'm not saying it is, I'm not saying it isn't, but I'm saying it, it seems to be a legitimate concern and it is something that in, in almost every place that you go, you find this concern. The only people probably who don't seem to have this concern are those who are convinced that they're already perfect. And they're already just waiting for Jesus to come and put the crowns on their heads and say, well done, good and faithful servant. The ones who are very strict, maybe about every detail of their lives and they think that they have made it, kind of like the Pharisees. But most of the rest of us are somewhat concerned. Now, when I look, look at the Bible, this is a legitimate concern because the Bible talks about holy living. As I, as I pointed out last week, there's a verse in Hebrews 8 that says we should follow after holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So it's a legitimate concern. Probably if I were to take each one of us privately and to ask you, what do you think is the key to living this life of victory? You might take me to verses like this. This is one of the verses that I've gone to over and over in looking at this question. And um, it's Luke chapter 14, verse 33 says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my, my disciple. You go a little further up in that same passage and he says the same a different way. It says, it says, Jesus says, whosoever doth not bear his cross, in verse 27, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is the passage in which Jesus advises us to count the cost. He talks about a man who sets out to build a tower and he, he sits down first and counts the cost, whether he's able to, to build that tower. He talks about a king going to war and he sits down first and he decides whether he can win this battle. And he says, in the same way, any of you who does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. This is a, a theme that we find several places, especially in the New Testament. I don't know how you feel about these statements. I know I've preached sermons on these verses. I'm going to say a little bit different this morning. All right, let me tell you that from the beginning. If you look at Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, it, it carries the same kind of idea. It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the, in the lust or the desires thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, of righteousness 
unto God. One of the songs that I I like very much, if my voice wasn't, if my voice hadn't grown so rusty, I might sing it this morning, but it says, um, is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does a spirit control. And one, and one line says, you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Sometimes you, you listen to that song. Those of you who know it, the sentiments of that song move you. I know, I know that they move me. Um, my sister used to sing it along with somebody else. There's a trio that used to sing it. And when I listen to it, I'm deeply stirred because it, it speaks of something that I desire. Be blessed and have peace and sweet rest. And it says this can only happen, happen as you yield him your body and your soul. Another verse says, we never can know what the Lord may bestow of the blessings for which we have prayed. When our body and soul he doth fully control and our all on the altar is laid. You get torn between two things. Number one, the beauty of the promise. The blessings for which we have prayed. The amazing things we have asked for. Maybe even, even for the gift of the spirit and the ability to raise the dead and heal the sick. We have these blessings. And it says, the song says, the key is yielding him your body and soul. All right. Everybody hears that and everybody believes that. I don't know if any of us here has undertaken to do this, to yield him your body and soul. And if, 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 if I read this situation correctly, I think you yield him your body and soul and you strive to do it more fully because you never quite succeeded. And you are not yet at the place where you can experience the power. So you keep on fighting and struggling to yield him your body and soul. We, we refer to it as surrender. There's another song that um, Brother Howard and I have made a little bit popular. It says, um, it says, many years I longed for rest, perfect peace within my breast. And I often sought the Lord alone with tears, but I would not make the price, pay the price. I would not make the sacrifice. So I wandered on and on for many years. And then it says, let me lose my life and find it, Lord, in thee. May all self be slain my friends see only thee so beautiful songs beautiful sentiments what we're, what i'm talking about is what we call surrender what we call surrender but one line of that song you know what one line of that song says it says oh how hard it was to die how hard it was to die and for self to crucify. Just to lose myself and find it, Lord, in thee. I see Donovan put up a link to the song, so maybe at the end I might play that song. But um, the song is not exactly the theme of my emphasis this morning. It's a part of what I'm saying, but it's not the emphasis. Do, do, do you, brothers and sisters, find that it is true that it is hard to die and it is hard to sacrifice, to crucify self? Do you find it is hard? It, in my experience, it is hard to die. Dying is never easy and it is never pleasant. So, based on what I just said, the pathway seems clear. The pathway is a path of death. The pathway is a part of surrender. But the question remains how to die, how to surrender, because you know and I know it is hard. If somebody has found it easy to surrender and easy to die to self, you could, you could comment on it in the chat. But in my experience, it, is not, it, it has not been easy. Last week, I mentioned how sometimes I fasted for three days. 
I mentioned all the efforts I made to, to bring myself into subjection to what I wanted to, to be and what I wanted to do. Somebody said I keep talking about my age these days, but we, it's, it's, it's kind of like a badge of honor. I made it to 70, all right? I'm 71 now. Every year that goes by, I'll keep mentioning it because I went a little further, but I'm 71. And let me tell you, at 71, the struggle, the idea of struggling further. I don't, I, I'm thinking to myself, if, 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 if my struggles have not gotten me there yet, oh goodness gracious me, what am I going to give next? What am I going to give next? That's kind of how you put it when you are 71. Am I, am I going to try harder? You know, the truth is, when we talk about surrender, you know what I find often? You know what happens again? What happens again is what we, we got away from at the beginning. You know what happens again? We start thinking of surrender and putting an emphasis on who? Who does the emphasis fall upon when we think about surrender and, and taking up the cross? Men, most of the time, the emphasis comes back on me. Is it? that we are taking a back door back to the, 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 the process of depending on human effort. I want you to consider this because it's not, it's not a, a, a trivial question, neither is it a superficial question if you consider it and think about yourself. We know that we are saved by faith, by grace through faith. But does Satan find a back door to get us to think we are saved by grace to, through faith? But we grow by our effort and our work. Is it really true that Jesus is everything, or is it that is it that it's Jesus at the start and myself as I continue the journey? Last night, we, we, we commented on a verse here in Colossians, and I want you to look at what it says. It says in verse 6, verses 6 and 7, it says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The word walk, the word walk is an expression of the way we live, the manner of our lifestyle. Paul says the same way you receive Jesus Christ, you are to continue this process. Well, somebody might ask, is there no growth then as a Christian? But he, Paul says our growth is to be rooted and built up in him. There is something that happened at the beginning. And what I understand him to be saying and what I understand the Bible to say is that if you move from that original process, you're going to fall into trouble. The little song that we sing says, Jesus Christ, yourself last and others in between. That's not what I, what, what I was thinking of. It's Jesus first, it's Jesus in the middle, and it's Jesus at the end, and Jesus all the way. Did God give us Jesus as the beginning of our faith, or did God give us Jesus to be the author and the finisher of our faith? At what point in the process does humanity take over? At what point in the process is it dependence on myself? At what point in the journey from Egypt to Canaan, in the journey from sin to righteousness, in the journey from this planet to heaven, at what point is it my job? Or is it that Christ is the answer at every step of the way? Now, here's a problem. Here's a problem. The argument can be made that if it's Christ alone, then it's very simple. All of us, everybody will be saved. Or everybody who chooses Christ at the beginning, once you make that first step, then you are saved. And you cannot be lost because it's, it's Jesus who does everything. That argument can be made. And it's a legitimate argument. How does that harmonize with what I'm trying to say when I say that everything is the work of Christ. <clears throat> there has to be a way to harmonize both things because 
First of all, you know, Jesus taught us. Jesus says this. Last week we, we looked at the verse. It says, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus says, my yoke is what? Easy. And my burden is light. And, and I have to admit, and some of you probably will, uh, will corroborate what I'm saying, that, that even in the searching for surrender, many times it seems like hard labor. It's a struggle. It's a struggle that sometimes we find ourselves failing over and over. Maybe, maybe failing constantly because the person who is not failing is the person who is walking in perfection. So it, so it seems like in the struggle for perfect surrender, because that's what we seem to be after, to, to eliminate failure, to eliminate sin, and to live a life of consistent victory. And every time we come short of that mark, it's frustration. It's go back to that place and start again and see where we did not surrender perfectly and try to fit ourselves into that place. And it can be extraordinarily frustrating. I understand it perfectly because I have walked that road. You know, the truth is the consequence of this kind of, 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 of situation. I'm going, to, I'm going to express it frankly and to the point. <clears throat> it's the same, the same thing that made the Pharisees' religion so evil. This is what made the religion of the scribes and Pharisees so evil. The, the point was that they had every good intention. What do you think was the, 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 the stated aim of the religion of the Pharisees? It was to make Israel a holier people. You know, Judah had been taken into captivity in Babylon. Why? Because the Bible tells you, it tells you in the book of Chronicles that they mocked the prophets. They, 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 they disobeyed God's commandments. They, they would not listen to what God says. And so God allowed them to go away into captivity. After they came out of Babylonian captivity, sometime afterwards, this, this group of Jews called the Pharisees developed. A clique developed in, in Judaism called the Pharisees. And their goal was to develop their religion to a place where they were so holy, where they were so obedient to the rules that God would never be displeased with them anymore. They wanted to be so perfect in obeying every rule that God would be so pleased with them, they could never again go back into Babylonian captivity. They decided to solve the problem of apostasy. They decided to solve the problem of the wrongdoing that made God continually displeased with them. And so they made all these rules and regulations to cover every iota of your behavior. I think they say you, you could carry enough milk about the size of an egg. They said you could carry your, your handkerchief on the Sabbath, but not your bed. They made rules for everything. You picked a piece of mint bush and you had to pay tight on it. Everything. Their idea was to become so perfect in obedience to God that they would never again go into apostasy. You know, they became the wickedest people. In, in the midst of their search for perfection, they became the wickedest people. They murdered the Son of God on a, on a Friday evening and were concerned that he should come down off the cross in order to stick to the rules so they could be pleasing to the God that they obviously did not know. In seeking to serve God, they became the wickedest people. What was the reason behind this? Why did they become so evil in seeking to please God? How could you have murder in your heart while you are under the illusion that you are serving God? You know what the problem was? They focused on the ways of God instead of the God who, who, who designed those ways. Or, or to leave, leave out the ways part. They focused on the ways of God and not on God himself. That was their problem. They knew all the rules. They knew all the scriptures. And they did not know God. That was their problem. The truth is, here's what, here's what I'm saying. When a person becomes obsessed with the problem 
of overcoming sin. Let me say this and listen to what I say. And if you don't agree with me, I will justify my position before I'm done. Okay. When a person becomes obsessed with overcoming sin, you know what your eyes are upon? Your eyes are upon sin. And because you're obsessed with overcoming sin, you're bound to set your eyes upon yourself because you are the one who is failing. You are the one who is who is being dominated by sin. And so you're so you're trying so hard to overcome sin as you understand it. In the process, the truth that old adage is fulfilled in your life by beholding we become changed you become like what you look at most of the time so because you're obsessed with sin sin multiplies in your experience absolutely true those who are more uh, most obsessed with overcoming sin are the ones who are most dominated by sin and the scribes and pharisees were the exemplification of what i'm saying they were they were the most the most pious murderers on the planet there were pious murderers there were people who were obsessed with with defining and with, with speaking against sin well they were the greatest sinners of all jesus called them children of the devil it's a lesson it's a lesson let me mute somebody is making a little bit of noise there it's a lesson that we should not forget you don't overcome sin by focusing on sin you don't become strong by focusing on what you must do this only makes you become performance oriented your your life centers around performance and, perf and as, as i say it always leads to a dependence on self so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to say seeking surrender does not bring surrender okay this is the first time it, I can express it clearly because in my mind it's very clear. Seeking surrender will not make you surrender. Neither will it give you rest. Jesus says that he will give you rest. Seeking, becoming obsessed with surrender and becoming obsessed with overcoming sin will not make you overcome sin. It will not make you surrender and it will not give you rest. It's one of the great ironies the great paradoxes that the thing that you seek most of all is what you are least likely to get if you seek the wrong way or if you seek for the wrong thing it's like have, have you ever have you ever found that you couldn't sleep one night and then you tried hard to sleep have you ever tried that that's a guarantee you're not going to sleep my poor wife understands this because she has a problem with sleeping at night there, there are some times when on rare occasions I, I wake up in the night, usually when my mind is agitated about something, and I, 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 I try to sleep and I can't, no matter what I try to do, they say count sheep, I count sheep. It doesn't help. Those confounded sheep won't, won't, won't put me to bed. Sometimes it helps when I play music. It works the opposite way with my, my wife. I need a little noise and she can't sleep. But I, it helps when I play music, but when I'm in this kind of state, nothing seems to work. The more I try not, not, the more I try to sleep, the more I am awake. Usually I get up and I, 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 I go on my computer and start to do some work or I start reading a book or something because it, it's, a, it's a principle. It's a principle. You know, the, the harder you try and become focused on certain things, the further they go from you. And it's that way with becoming obsessed about overcoming sin and becoming obsessed about surrender. The more fixated you become upon these things, the, the greater the guarantee that you won't have them. Nobody ever over, overcame sin by, by numbering his sins and determining to fight against those sins. Nobody ever surrendered to God by trying hard to put himself out of the way. It doesn't work like this. Now, even before I come to the, the, the solution to this problem, I'm going to point out that this is usually based upon a false foundation. We make a false assumption. From the beginning, we have a false assumption. 
and it, 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 it may not be so deep rooted in this fellowship because as we have been in a process of being educated by the Lord, some things are becoming clearer. But I'll tell you what this false foundation is. This false foundation is the idea that we were, God created us in order that we could perform. Go back to the very beginning and think of the beginning when God created man. What did God create me and you for? A fundamental question. If you don't get the answer right, you're going to end up focusing on the wrong thing. Why was I created? What did God want when he made me? What did he want? What did God, the almighty, the infinite almighty God, what was he after when he made something like me? Okay. Not for anybody to answer, but for everybody to think about. God had something in mind. And the, the emphasis of most religion and most religious people, including people in, in, in our own category, maybe, is that people think God created us in order to, so we could perform. When I say perform, I was made in order to, to, to fulfill moral standards. People live like this is my purpose. What am I in this world for? To live morally. Okay, like my whole purpose in life is to fulfill a moral standard. I was made so I could defend the rules and the laws. That's my purpose. And that's what God is obsessed with. God is obsessed with my performance. God wants to see me perform and obey the rules and do right. And that is what God is obsessed with. And that becomes my obsession because I believe that is what God is obsessed with. Was that what? You know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus addressed it a little bit when he said, when he said to the people, when he said to the Jews, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. He was expressing the principle that I'm trying to get across. He was saying, I didn't create you in order that you can keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not the goal and you are the means to reach the goal. No, it was the other way around. I created you for a purpose and the Sabbath was a way of enhancing that purpose the sabbath was for your benefit but you are the point you are the reason and the sabbath was peripheral to you that's what he's saying and we can apply this to all the commandments you were not made for the commandments the commandments or the law or the rules came into the picture for your benefit but what are you about why were you created if you get it wrong you become obsessed with morality and you evaluate yourself by your works. How can you avoid it? If you think that God values you because of your works, if you think that God created you in order for you to perform, then what are you obsessed with morning, night, and noon? You're obsessed with your performance. And when your performance is not good, what do you do? You feel depressed, you feel inadequate, you feel rejected because God created me to perform and I'm not performing right. And you are depressed, rightly so. We evaluate ourselves by our works. And we not only evaluate ourselves by our works, we evaluate other people by their works. And so those who don't perform as well as we perform, they are despised and they are looked down upon. What is the truth? What were we created for? I saw Sister, I think it's Sister Jessica, I saw a message flash on the screen while I was speaking and she said we were created for friendship. And I like that. I'm going to put it another way. I just want to read this verse and just think about what was going through the mind of our father. When he said in Genesis 1 and verse 26, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. It doesn't tell you exactly there why god created man but it says that god made a decision after god had made the, the earth probably the universe god says let us make man what was he after what did god almighty want we can find a few clues in some places like i said when jesus says the sabbath was made for man he told us what we were not made for but here's a here's a verse that we often use in defense of the sabbath but i want you to look at it and think about it 
God says, if, if, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Let me pause there. God speaks of something as the purpose and the goal. I'm not talking about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is just what he mentions here. But I, I could bring the Sabbath into it because I believe that why God blessed the Sabbath at the beginning was because the Sabbath was a key element in fulfilling God's purpose for creating me. Why did God give man the Sabbath? God gave man the Sabbath as a time for fellowship with God. As God says here, if you shall, you shall delight yourself in the Lord. You know, when I was going through these thoughts, some thoughts came to me that I never thought of before. You know, I never thought of before. I realized that the whole reason why God created men was for relationship. God created us for relationship. God made me, Sister Jessica, kind of, Jessica, kind of, Touched on it when she says we were, we were created for friendship. All God wanted from humanity, all God wanted from humanity was friendship. What else did God want from me? I want you to think about it. And if you can think about anything else, let me know. But as I think about it, the only thing that God wanted from humanity was a relationship. It was Sister Vanessa who said it. Okay. God, God wanted, God created us so we could be his friends. God created us to be his friends. And it's strange because as I was thinking ab about it, I always think about this. Every time I go to, to talk to the Lord, I'm thinking of the great God Almighty. I think of the universe. I think of the intricacy of, of microscopic things. I think of the, 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 the great vastness and, and the magnitude and, and the, the, the infinite wisdom it took to put all this together. And I'm thinking, how could such a person find pleasure in my companionship? How could such a person find pleasure in being my friend? And I realized that's why God made me with a free will. God gave me with a free will and an independent mind so I could choose this friendship, because friendship means nothing unless you choose to be a person's friend. God wanted friendship. That's what God wanted from me most of all. My performance, my performance was always not a question, not an issue. I'm going to tell you, the people who are your best friends, their performance is not the reason why, why, why you are their friends. When your friends fail, how do you feel? You want to jump in and help them. You want to lift them up. When your friends do something that is, is outrageous, you, you join with them in, 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 in being amazed at what they did. And you might say to them, no, man, let's not do this. You, you talk to them as friends. You talk to them as people on the same level. You don't reject and turn them away. When you turn people away and you reject them because the performance is not good, you know that that person is not your friend. That's why when you get, when you get married, you say, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, at least the good old time marriage is, for better, for worse, in poverty, in riches, until death do us part. That's why you say it, because that's what friendship is about. And God designed life to be this way because God is the God of relationships and that's how God wants it to be. That's how God designed it to, to be between us and him. You and I, friends forever no conditions but that you want my friendship god almighty god almighty wanting my friendship it's it's mind blowing and i realize that not because of this it's not just it's not just us and god look at what god says in genesis 2 and verse 3 genesis 2 and verse 3 Okay, Genesis 2 and verse 3. No, not that one. Genesis 2 and verse 18, is it? Yeah, Genesis 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, 
It is not good that the man should be alone. It is not good that the man should be alone. Do you realize that God also made us? It, he also made our lives meaningful because of relationships. I gave this some thought and I realized that the greatest thing in human experience is relationship. Do you realize that if there were no relation, if there were, if there was, if you didn't have a relationship with anybody, you wouldn't bother to wear clothes. If you were the only people on the person on the planet, you would soon take your own life. You wouldn't bother to wear clothes. There would be no reason for you to live. You wouldn't build a, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be in a job. You probably wouldn't even build a house. You'd probably live under a tree somewhere. The, the reason why our lives exist and why our lives are, are the way they are is because of relationships. That's what we were designed for. The purpose and the meaning of life is relationships. This was always the goal. And the reason behind the whole universe is relationships. The, the, the curse of the human race is that we have made our reason performance. We have made performance the reason for our existence. We go to a job and we, uh, our performance is important. We, we play a game and we always, we, we, we measure ourselves and the world measures us by our performance. Whether we, we succeed in our performance or we fail in our performance. There is, a, there is nobody and there's rarely anybody who just views you and loves you for the friend that you are, regardless of your performance. And we have imposed the same kind of idea upon our God. The reason of the universe is relationship. And when we think that the reason of the re universe is relationship, you know what happens? The goal becomes the person, not his rules. When we understand this, we come to God and to Christ in the right way. The reason is the person. The goal is the person, not his rules, not to perform for his sake, because that's never why he created us. And that's not what he wants. We no longer measure ourselves by our performance when we understand this. This is why Jesus will say to these people, look at what he says. He says, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Okay. That's a strange statement to make because they, are, they, are, they come and they are enumerating in your name, we have done many wonderful works. And Jesus says, I will tell them, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. That's the problem. It wasn't your works or your lack of works. It was that we never had a relationship. I didn't know you. You focused on the wrong thing. You spent your life laboring for the works. You went through all these hard and difficult places to perform this, these wonderful works. And I never knew you. We were never friends. You missed the point. And you missed the mark. And this brings me to something. Now I understand, you know, now I understand why in God's kingdom, do you know what is the greatest thing? You know what is the greatest thing? The greatest thing in the kingdom of God is love. God is love and the greatest element in the kingdom of God is love. Do you know why? Because the basis of re relationship is love. Do you understand that? Do you see this? The basis of successful relationship is love. I, I, I am grateful to, for the Lord to show me this. I'm grateful for the Lord to show me this. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this after a while. But I mean, even in my life, I've been so guilty. My relationship with people has been so very often dependent upon how they performed. If their behavior was pleasing in my sight, then I would gravitate towards them. If their dis behavior displeased me, then I would gravitate away from them. But the Lord says that the glue in his kingdom, the thing that is the greatest thing in his kingdom is love. And, and the Bible itself says that we should be perfected in love. That the greatest point at which the church or the kingdom that Daniel was talking about this morning, the kingdom is perfected when the kingdom is perfected in love for the Lord and love for one another. 
That is why a few weeks ago I came to the conclusion that the seal of God. It may have some outward expression, but the seal of God ultimately is God's love perfected in us. It's the name of God, the love of God, the character of God inscribed in the minds of God's people. This is the mark that you have become like God. This is the mark that God is living in you. This is the mark that you, are, you, you have reached the place that God wants you to get to. It's when God's love is shed abroad, is pouring out of you, and this love is impacting people. And the relationship is right because the glue that makes it work, the love, the unconditional love is there. Check it out, brothers and sisters. Every, every relationship that falls apart, every friendship that fails, every marriage that, that goes on the rocks, it's because love is not unconditional. Acceptance is not unconditional. People are accepted based on their performance, and the lack of performance makes things shatter and break apart. Don't impose this upon our God. God is not like this. God's love for us and God's relationship with us is not conditional on our behavior. What God wants of you is not your, your performance, it's your heart. It's your heart, brothers and sisters. So when we go seeking for victory over sin, when we go seeking to perform right, know that we must seek in the right way. And let us look now at God's appointed way. Because I'm not saying that God, God says your behavior is irrelevant. I'm saying you're not going to get that by searching for that. That's what I'm saying. God has given us something more fundamental and says, and he says, if you, if you get this more fundamental point, the rest will fall into place. I'm not giving you that as your job because that is hard work, because that is frustration and pressure. I'm not giving you that job. That's not your business. It is Christ who works in you to, to will and to do of his good pleasure. I'm not giving you that job. I'm going to give you a job that is pleasurable and that you can do. What is that job? Romans 6 verses 4 to 6 says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like us Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should also walk in newness of life. Paul is suggesting that living the new life is a consequence of something. It's not the consequence of your hard work and your hard struggle. It's the consequence of being baptized into Jesus Christ. He says that's what happens. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. It's a consequence. And here's how he explains it in verse 6. Knowing this, that our, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, I know that it's not very clear yet, okay? But what we can see clearly in these verses is that the process of surrender, the process of overcoming sin, is a consequence of being dead with Christ. It is in Christ that we experience this death to sin. That's what we can see clearly in these verses. In Romans 7 and verse 6, it says, is it verse 6? No, no, it's verse 4. It says, wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law, by the body of Christ. Again, it makes out that it is a consequence. When you are married to Christ, when you are baptized into Christ, sin comes to an end. Your, your obligation to the law comes to an end. That's what Paul says. So the question before us is, how do you die with Christ? How are you baptized into Christ? How, you, how do you become dead by the body of Christ? One thing we can see is that he is the one who puts me to death. I'm going to put it another way. The presence of Jesus Christ in my life induces a certain result. And that certain result is what we call surrender or death to sin. I don't die to sin by focusing on sin. I don't surrender by trying to surrender. 
surrender appears, death appears by my relationship to Jesus Christ. That's what I'm saying. You know that old saying that I like to quote. I looked at Jesus and the dove of peace flew into my heart. I looked at the dove and it flew away. I looked at Jesus and I found myself surrendered. I looked at surrender and I lost surrender. I looked at Jesus and victory over sin became my experience, simple and easy and effortless. I looked at victory over sin and sin invaded my life. The point I'm making, brothers and sisters, is that God has given us one answer, not several answers. That is so blessedly simple because I'm an uncomplicated person. I like one thing that I can fix my eyes on and get my teeth into. And when I do this, the rest of it takes care of itself. That's how I like life. I'm not like Brother brother Ian or some of these guys. I never could play the piano because my hand can't be doing this and the other hand doing this. I, 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 I can't manage it. It's one thing, and I become obsessed with one thing. I can't multitask. Not a, not a criticism of other people. I'm just saying that is, that is why I am so loving when there's just one answer because i can get my teeth into that and i need, need to look left or right like i said in our meeting last night the greatest the best thing that ever happened in my life was that when i became a christian i set one goal and one goal and oh god i've suffered the times i've forgotten it but it has it has been my stay why i've been a christian all these years i made up my mind at the beginning I was so desperately in need of one thing. I needed a friend who would stay with me and tell me how to live my life because I was messed up. I needed a friend and I made up my mind that there's only one good thing that I can look for in the life. I'll never be rich. I'll never be great. I'll never be famous. I'll never be, be, be some great scientist or make some great contribution like become a Nobel Prize winner or an Einstein or somebody. But I knew there was something in which I, if I made up my mind, I could become the best. And I made up my mind, I'm going to become the best friend that God has. That's what I did. That's what I did. 40, 48 years ago, I made up my mind I was going to become God's best friend. It was, they, they, I, I, God put that in my heart and he never gave me anything better. It was the greatest and the best thing that ever happened to me. And sometimes I drift away from the mark, but he always brings me back there because it's the one simple, single answer. The more I am in the friendship with him, when I'm with him and I'm laughing with him and I'm locked away with him, where can sin walk into my life? Where can lack of surrender come in? Then, then my life is a dream. Then my life is beautiful. I'm not thinking about living above sin. It becomes irrelevant. All I want to do is to hold to the Lord and everything falls into place. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. The stress begins when I start looking for Christ. Plus, then the stress begins. And I have to get beaten again and again until I find my way back. Sin disappears naturally when we focus on him. So what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, when we have found our true place in life, our journey is not a quest for morality. It's not a quest for good behavior. It's a quest for relationship. Here is the, 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 the thing that you can make and you can do it. You can't make yourself surrender. You can't kill yourself. You can't kill yourself spiritually. You can't do it. You can't overcome sin, put your eyes in that direction, and you are doomed for failure perpetually. But here is something you can do, everybody in this room. The faces I'm seeing before me, Nina, Sister Leanne, Sister Doreen, Sister Miriana, or her daughter. Brother Ken, Sister Natalie, Brother Ian, and Brother Raymond's logo. You all can make friends. You all can make friends. And I'll tell you, the key to friendship is to love the other person. Is to, is to love the other person. That's what God says. Love the other person. And, and, and focus on 
loving the person, guaranteed friendship. Christ is to be our obsession. When we legitimately find our place in life, Christ becomes our obsession. And in that process, we find that everything falls into place. Our behavior, everything falls into place. This is a battle that feels right. And it's a battle that we can win. Everybody here knows how to make friends. Even, even my little, my youngest grandchild, three years old, he knows how to make friends. I remember many years ago, when we had a camp meeting at, at um, Mount Glory, there were two little boys. One of them was Brother Lenny's son, Sam. And the other one was another little boy. I forget who was the other one. Might have been Dean Mark. Or it might have been a, a little boy named Timmy. One of them. But these two little guys, I saw them. They were meeting each other for the first time. They might have been about four or five. The two little boys came face to face. They stood there for about... 10 seconds looking at each other. Then one of them just touched the other one with his fist and ran off. And the other one was off behind him. And just like that, those little boys became the best of friends at the camp. Just like that. And I watched in amazement and I thought, for, human, for, for adults, it's so complicated. But at the same time, look here, anybody knows how to make friends. Everybody knows how to make friends. Usually what comes in, 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 in between is the is the conditions we place on each other conditions behavior conditions okay we want performance before we can make you into our friends we want you to see you perform a certain way even in the religious world even in our religious fellowship those who don't conform to our standards of morality we hold them at a distance i have been guilty of it it has been very often my mode of operation and the lord is showing me that this is wrong this is why love is the greatest element in his family and in his kingdom because his kingdom is a kingdom of relationships it's that, that is why daniel this morning was talking about the kingdom and learning more and more how fundamental and and, and <clears throat> how central to Christ is the issue of his body and the unity of his body and the oneness of his kingdom. I believe we're going to see the glory of God again, but I believe more these days that it's going to be in the context of a kingdom in which the, the relationships are right between us and God and between us and our brethren, because that is the reason why we were created. We were not created for a moral universe. We were created for a universe of relationships. This is a battle that we can win. Fight, yes, fight. I'm not saying sit down and do nothing, fight. But let the fight be the fight to be friends with God. Let the fight be the fight to be in the right relationship. You are perfectly justified if you feel like your life is not, 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 not being conformed enough to the will of God. You're perfectly justified. Go and seek the Lord. Bind yourself in a closer relationship. Spend more time with him. Read his word. Listen for his voice constantly. You are perfectly justified. This is not a mark where you can say, okay, today, I didn't speak my own words on the Sabbath. Friendship is so fluid that you can come today and you can spend a little time with your friend and you are still locked in. Friendship is such a thing that maybe today you, you, you had a, a, a very distracted time and you never got to spend the time with him, but you are still locked into that friendship. You can always find ways to build a friendship if you feel it's dying down. You can always identify when something is a little bit off. You go to pray and you can't quite feel that sense of his presence. It's easy to work on. That is a job that I am putting before every one of us. It's a legitimate job. It's a job that God has given to us as the one single thing to abide in Christ, to abide in him, to stay with him. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 15, he who abides in me bears much fruit. Fruit bearing takes place, but it takes place by abiding in Christ, not by trying to bear fruit.
And the final point I'll make. It's hard for me to love people. All right, I'll tell you how to do it. Okay, I'll tell you how to do it. I realize that the way to love people is not to try to love them. Mm -hmm. It's to go with Christ as he goes to love them. Do you get what I'm saying? I can go with Christ as he goes to love people. If I'm running my own life, it's hard to love people. But if I'm locked in with Jesus, when I see, when I, if I'm listening to him, because Jesus says, if a man love me, he will keep my word. We, we, we ought to listen to him continually. And when Jesus says, I want to go, I want you to go, I want to go and visit Sister Doreen, I will say, I will go with you. And if the Lord says, I want you to, to, to help Brother Ken to do some work on uh, uh, what he's doing, you say, no, I want to go and help Brother Ken. You say, I will go with you, Lord. I'm not running my life. I'm so locked into him. I'm not running my life. If, if, if I have my agenda today, I need to, I need to do A, B, C. I need to, I need to cut the yard. I need to finish my article. I need to go to town and buy something. And the Lord, and, and I'm with the Lord. And the Lord says, today, I just want you to forget everything. I, today, my plan, my plan is, I'm going to go and visit this, this sick person or something commonplace. Today, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to take, I'm going to, I'm going to take over the duties in your home that your wife would normally do. I'm going to wash the dishes. I'm going to sweep, sweep, sweep the house or whatever else. I'm going to do this today. And you say, I will go with you, Lord. That's how we can learn to love people. I myself don't have the capacity. I myself don't have the impelling desire to do these things. But when I am locked in with the Lord, Jesus first, Jesus says to me, this is what I'm going to do today. And you say, I will come with you. And you find his love coming through you and impacting other people. I think this is what it means when it says, these are they that follow the lamb wherever he goes. We follow him in the world made new. We follow him in heaven because we have followed him on this planet. When Jesus goes and you say, I will come with you. That's the way that we can find that morality appearing in our lives. But not because we are seeking morality, but because we have, we have sought the Lord and we have found the Lord. It's no longer a chore. When I was a little boy, I wash the dishes and I never complain. I wash the clothes and I never complain. You know why? My mother was doing it and I was there with her. When I was a little boy, my mother always marked me because we never had washing machines in those days. And she had six children at the time. And she'd be outside in the, in the, in the evenings washing in the big wash tub. And I would be beside her and she would say, they call me Jimmy. Jimmy, go inside. And I wouldn't leave her. And when she, 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 she was wringing the big sheet, I would hold one side and she would wash the other side. She'd wring the other side. She'd wring the other side. And maybe I wasn't a help. Maybe I was a hindrance. But my mother was so delighted. And because she was there, it was fine. And while, when it came to washing dishes, she would wash and I would rinse and we'd be, we'd be there together. And it was a joy because I was with my mother. When I was sent to do it by myself, it was so difficult. And that's the key to living the Christian life. That's the key to living the victorious life. It's hard when you're looking at yourself. It's hard when you're looking at the job. But when you have your eyes on the Lord, you don't even see the job. You don't even see the duty. Nothing matters but the Lord. And so the duties take care of themselves. That is the way it is, brothers and sisters. That's the way God designed it to be. One answer, one focus, the same focus and the same answer for which God created you and me into the universe. We were created for relationship. And when we find that relationship, we finally return to the place where our God wants us to be. That's where I'm going to stop for today. I, 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 I'm not good at making appeals. <laughs> I'm not good at closing off my thoughts, but I hope that we have all understood and that these thoughts have been embedded deeply in our minds. That's my prayer. That's my hope. And I hope that, you know, these things will be reflected in our lives. God bless you.
Let me have a closing prayer. I don't know if there's going to be any questions, but let me have a closing prayer and then we'll take any questions if there are any. Oh, my dear loving beloved father. And your son, our savior, Jesus Christ, I'm here talking to the both of you this morning, this afternoon. I'm appreciative of this message. Dear Father, I don't know how much this has reached home to the hearts of my brothers and sisters, but you know, it has impacted my heart. I, 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 I see your truth and I appreciate it. Every day there's so much more that you, you teach us, so much further you lead us. And I appreciate it. On behalf of my brothers and sisters, I want to say thank you. I ask you now to dismiss us with your blessing. And keep us locked into that relationship with you as we look forward to meeting you again in this meeting format in another couple of hours. Thank you, Father. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Looks like it's only you, Brother Ray. You can go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment that I'm under the impression from what I heard this morning, which is beautiful, that uh, you are sort of because i'm going to the same experience you are sort of leaning more into the second that and each day more and more and more and departing away from the world more and more and more and that's why you are being inspired to bring forth these wonderful messages that's all i want to say say okay. okay thank you brother Ray. Okay. Every... Thank you, brother Ray. Every... can you hear me david i'm hearing you very well okay does our performance in any way affect the quality of the relationship? I think on our part, it does, from our side. So what decides God making a decision to end the relationship? Or are you saying that God never decides to end the relationship? It's we who decide to end this relationship. And I'm thinking in regards to blasphemy of the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. Does our performance not play a role in how that happens? If I, let, let me break it down as I understand it. I understand that the relationship with God is based entirely on faith. And that what God has reconciled us to himself through his son, Jesus Christ, and that, that reconciliation is unconditional. In other words, God has already taken care of every sin. God is not imputing the trespasses of the world onto the world. So it's impossible on God's side for a sin to ever become an obstruction between us and God, because that is already taken care of from God's point of view. So the, the obstructions that remain have to be on our side. So our unbelief and our, our failure impacts on us. Sometimes we can become so focused on ourselves and our performance that it causes our relationship with God to degrade not because God is any less open and warm and giving, but we have closed the door. Now, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is exactly, I think it's expressed in the very term. The blasphemy is on our part. And the blasphemy on our part is what closes the door. So I don't think that God ever says, ever says, I'm going to leave you. I think we say, we don't want you anymore. And God, responds to our desire i think that's that's the proper perspective and that's the way i would put it brother Jerome. i just want to say that i think this is one of my favorite um presentations from you it's an excellent presentation i think there is more truth so much truth that you have given out in this presentation and i think you're absolutely right my only struggle is david is when you ask the question because I'm having a hard time reconciling why it is that in scripture, almost as much time, if not more time, is spent in warnings about what a relationship with God looks like in as much time as it's spent speaking about what affords us the quality of that relationship. And why would the scripture spend so much time on warnings concerning what the relationship should look like if performance within the relationship is not important even as i understand what you're saying 
that it's more so about the relationship than the performance. I am always concerned, um, and that is something that is never far from my mind, David, if you understand the question. I understand the question perfectly, Brother Joel, and, and it's a legitimate question, and um, it's, 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 it's a legitimate concern. And I, I, may, I may suggest something which I don't know if it's an adequate answer, but I will say that, you know, um, what is it? Maybe 75% maybe of the Bible is the Old Testament. <laughs> maybe 75, maybe 66%, somewhere there, is the Old Testament. And the Old Covenant is, is you, you would, I would think, from my own understanding and my own preference, if I had it to write, I would make the New Covenant 90% and the Old Covenant 10%. That's what I would do. But God has not designed it that way. He makes the Old Covenant the, the much greater majority. And if you even go to the, the New Testament, um, I will find where Jesus says, a man comes to Jesus and says, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? Jesus says, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. The, the entire Sermon on the Mount is a sermon, is an emphasis on behavior and performance. I agree with you that the, the places where the way is pointed out, they are not as, they are not as voluminous, they are not as many as it seems that the, 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 the way, the, how the way looks, how does it look? How does the Christian life look? How should it look? That seems to be more, more, more emphasized. Now, <clears throat> maybe this is God's design. Maybe it's a part of that whole process where God says he speaks in parables or, or he hides things from the wise and prudence and, and re reveals it on the babes and sucklings because the majority of Christians go to the Bible, the vast majority, and they come away with a performance-based emphasis. It takes some searching to get to pinpoint the way. It takes some searching. Hallelujah. I'm not denying this. So I'm Hallelujah. saying that may even be by God's design. Because, you know, the, the Bible seems to be this kind of book where the greatest points are hidden to some extent. So maybe that's the answer. David, that is not a small answer for me. I feel like it's the Spirit of God. That's, a, in my estimation, a brilliant answer that the Lord gave you in terms of why it is like that, in terms that these treasures are hidden and have to be searched out, and not why you might find that um, we have predominantly, uh, you know, speak, speaking about the whole. Um, I, I agree with the statement. I, I just want to say before I leave quickly that I'm particularly grateful for what you said about a focus on surrender not being the way even as a focus on co-laboring or laboring for God is not the way. I'm really grateful for that. Thank you very much. You helped me with that presentation. God bless you, Brother Joel. And um, your questions are sometimes difficult, but I appreciate them because they always um, open up the topic a little bit more. So, Brother yeah. David. I I'm, not, I'm not interrupting any of you. Huh? <clears throat> Go ahead, brother. Sam. Why are you always laughing when I say that? You always excuse me, brother. I don't know. I don't know why I do that because other people interrupt you. And, you let, know, me you let me tell you why. Let me tell you why, brother. I just think it's, it's something about my voice you don't like, maybe. <laughs> maybe the way I sound. But <clears throat> once again, God law. It's the law of love. I told you his government have a law. It's the law of love. He wants us to love him in return. He loves us, and he wants us to love him. And that's the problem we all are having. How can we express this love? Most of us in the beginning thought we had to work to do it. Because Jesus says, you love me, keep my commandments. So we thought, hey, we keep his commandments, we'll show, we'll show love to him. Now in the process, how do we show love to God? Okay, um, okay, Brother Sam. Um, we, we show love to God. Well, 
there, there, there are some people who think you show love to God by keeping 10 rules. I, I'm sure you're not saying that, okay? We show love to God by listening to him and by responding to him. The same way you show love to your wife and the same way your wife shows love to you. Listen to you and respond. That's how you know she loves you. I know my wife loves me because she goes out of the way to try to please me, to try to prepare the right kind of food. Sometimes she comes and says, what do you want to eat? And I, I say, whatever you want. They say, no, tell me because I want to make you happy or whatever. I want to give you something that will, she's concerned about me. And it's the same way in any relationship, including the relationship with God. We are responsive to him. That's what you do when you love somebody. Some people are mistaken. They think that it means following 10 rules. That's what you do to the police and that's what you do to the government. But when you love somebody, it goes way beyond that. Okay? Okay. Sister Clarice, I think, wanted to say something. Yes. Yes, Brother David. <clears throat> I am grateful for the message that you um, had today. But I something really struck me that talks about our relationship with Christ and or with God and Christ. And while you were sharing, I jot down certain things and I also look up certain cross reference. But one of the things I want to say first is that you have um, enforced that we are saved through grace, we are saved by grace through faith. And with that, yes, I strongly believe that. That is not by our works. But we are so grateful for the grace through faith that we want to do something to please God. We want to 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 um please him to show that we are grateful for the grace as a gift that he gave us. So what about being obedient to him? What about as as the brother just um that just speak and ask the question, what can we do to show Christ that we appreciate him or that we or, or you know and and I I also wrote down some cross reference scriptures about love um John 15 verse 9 and verse 12 and verse 16 verse sorry verse 15 14 15 and 17 you know, and they all talks about love, and if you love him, you are to obey his commandments, which it's not really focusing, in my mind, I'm thinking that it is not focusing so much on the commandments, but that we should obey him, you know, listen to him, seek him out, you know, search him out, we, we, we search out, search out the mysteries of his love. Um, am I correct? You you are absolutely right. That's the last point I made. And I, I wanted to dwell on that point some more, but I thought I was running out of time because I had as references also where Jesus says, if a man love me, he will keep my word. So so you're you're absolutely right when you say he's not talking about the necessarily ten statements. He's talking right. about listening to him and responding to him that's what you do when you love a person that's what right. that's what happens when when that's why if i if i ignore my wife or i don't listen to her she says she might think you don't love me because when you love a person if i love a person my delight is to be with the person and that's why i said if jesus says let's go to the park today i'm saying i'm coming because i don't want to be out of his presence so whatever he says I'm sensitive to it because I love him. Those who don't love him, they have a set of rules that they try to follow. Those who love him, they are listening for his voice because the rules are not the person. Those who don't love him, they are satisfied with the rules. But those who love him, they want the person. And to have the person, you have to be listening for his voice. So right. I agree with you very much, my sister. So so um, I, I am recently 
um, strengthening my relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ, my Savior, right? And so therefore, I am, I am, I am, what should say, more and more interested in reading the Bible and learning more of him, you know, and linking up with different persons that where we have Bible studies together. And one of my friends, which is Venice, um, told me about you. And from a long time, I wanted to get on, but I could not get on with the phone I had. So as soon as I get this phone, I ask her, what is the logo? What is the, um, the connection? And I'm so happy that I am able to, to log on because it, 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 this is, I, I see this group as, as a, a, I don't see it as a denominational group or a denomination group or, or a religious group. I just see this group as, as a group that want to bring in Jesus and teach the truth. And that is why I gravitate to this group, Pretty you know, I, right. You know, so I'm really happy for you answering my questions and the fact that you have enforced what I've always been thinking and reading of that you're saved by grace through faith. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Sister Clarice. It's really wonderful to have you as a part of our fellowship and I appreciate those comments. The Lord continue to bless you abundantly. Thank you, man. most welcome. Is this Sister Elizabeth? Okay, I heard what you said. Sure. I heard the responses from everybody, but you know, when you said that you wanna, uh, if, if God said, okay, today, come on, let's go over here. You say, I want to go. Okay. In my mind, because I'm, I'm trying to make this practical, and I'm sure like everybody else is. But in my mind, I'm thinking, we know without a shadow of a doubt that God will not disappoint us. We know this. There's no question in our mind that God will not disappoint us. He won't lie to us. He won't any of that stuff that humans will do. How, 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 just how do I deal with idiots, with liars, with thievery? If God say, come go, I'm going to say, Lord, I don't want to go because, because I don't want to go over there. So does that mean that I don't have any love? Okay, so let's just say, for instance, let's just say I don't have love. How do you have love for that? When you try to show people who are doing that, hey, there's a better way. They say, no, I just, I want to continue to do it this way. I don't look forward to to being around a certain kind of people. I just don't look forward. No. Do I realize that they're human? Yes. Do I realize that they they're in need of a savior? Yes. But they they don't want it. So, you know, I I realized when I said I used to say I'm just going to tolerate them, but there's no love in toleration. So that's out the picture. Yeah. So, um... How do you make well, this, you know, practical and real? You know, I can say this, but do I really feel this? Well, it, it starts it starts with recognizing that I'm a liar and a thief too. Okay, it starts with recognizing that this has been my life, and that the only reason why it's a little different is because at the moment Christ is in my life, so it helps. Because and, when I was when I was a liar and a thief, when that was my lifestyle. Somebody loved me, and he loved me unconditionally. So it helps. That's the first place to start. But the second place is that 
you recognize that your feelings don't matter. You have come to the place where Jesus is everything. And if Jesus says, I'm going into the ghetto, or if he says, I'm going to the hospital, or I'm going into a den of thieves, I'm going into the most despised people, you just say, I'm coming with you. It's a question of who goes with you. If you say, I don't want to go with you, you're actually saying, your friendship is not the most precious thing to me. And then that means you need to work on that friendship because for me, I, 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 I may not have the courage, I may not have the commitment, but I want it with all my heart. I want to be anywhere the Lord is. It doesn't matter. If he's hanging on a cross as a thief, I want to be hanging there with him. So I want to be where the Lord is. And that is what makes the difference to sell this bit. When you, when you think about my feelings, my perspective, my ideas, it's never going to seem right. But the whole key is to lose all of that, to lose yourself because you have found that the Lord is everything. That's what, what I was trying to emphasize. Jesus becomes everything. So the rest of it doesn't matter. And that's the goal. Maybe we're not there at the moment, but that's the one thing to be sought after. It's not to seek to learn to love. It's not to seek to be patient with thieves and criminals. It's to seek to be wrapped up in the Lord in such a way that nothing matters but him. That's the way. How do you how do you hold your tongue on something like that? Because, you know, just like I'm talking to you, you know, I talk to God. Like, you know, Lord, how do I stop saying you idiot? You know, how do I do that when I mean it? Uh, you know. I, I, I mean, the only thing I can say is the more, the closer we come to the Lord, the less we see ourselves and the less we are concerned about our feelings and the more about his. That's the, that's the only thing I can say because that's the only answer that I can see. I mean, I could say go to a psychologist and ask them to help change your thinking. And I'd be a fool if I said this because I don't believe in those methods. I believe that Jesus is the answer. Always was, always will be. is the one answer God gave us. And so I believe that in, in immersing ourselves in him, things come right. Those questions are the questions that deal with details. And the details are always complicated because the details mean you're looking at the problems one at a time. But I would say that there's one comprehensive, complete answer. Lose yourself in him and the rest will fall into place. Okay. Yes. All right. I think that, that it's one thing. Ready, David? We have two hours. Um, who was that? That's Tina. That's Tina. Hi. Go ahead. Um, I find that nothing teaches more like experience. So for me, I know that it was a struggle without God or Jesus. And I find that when you're in a place where the only thing you need is peace, you turn to Jesus and as you put it is you build a friendship and when that with that friendship you get something as simple as peace that the only thing you want to focus on is him and when mm -hmm. you're in that state I find that he uses you to do his work without you even asking him what should I do today what do you want me to do what is it that you want me to fulfill no your my experience my only goal is to keep that peace and the only place I find it is in Christ and with that, I find that he uses me um, to the point where I don't even focus on it. I don't even pay it any attention to say, oh, Lord is using me to do this until somebody might say, oh, you know that this happened to me. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, that's a testimony right there. But yeah. I find that when you're in that place, the only thing you want is friendship. And with that focus, he guides and leads everything in your life without you even realizing so I think I understand what you mean when you say just build that friendship. Because to be honest, it's the only thing that matters. And with that state of mind, he uses you. Thank you, Tina. That's when you can really say his yoke is easy and his burden is light. 